Hi, it's Annalise from Attuned Foods uh, coming at you with Around the Table with Attuned Foods. So thank you for joining today's Hangout on Air. I'm here with a wonderful group of people to talk about baking with natural sweeteners. So our guest of honor is Ricky Heller. She's a cookbook author and wrote a book on baking with natural sweeteners. So it seemed like such a nat natural reason to chat with her during cookie baking season to hear about ways that we can just kind of use more natural sweeteners in our actual cookie baking and other sorts of dessert holiday baking. So we've got Ricky Heller, so she's going to be sharing with us her tips on baking with natural sweeteners. Um, along with Ricky, we've got JL Fields, who's our plant-based team leader. And JL is going to be monitoring any questions that you have. Please go ahead and enter those on the event page. JL will capture those questions, and then we will ask them and have some really good conversation about that. And then we have Chef Dennis Litley of the Google Plus Food Bloggers community. We're thrilled to have him on board, too. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank well, thanks you. for having me. Thank you. So to kick things off, Ricky, um, you know, this time of year is considered a time of just kind of going for indulgence. And people just kind of... Uh, just go for it in terms of sweets and desserts and decadent uh, treats in baking. You know, I would love to hear a little bit about what is your story and how did you get started or why did you start baking with natural sweeteners? Sure, and it's interesting you say that because, of course, that's how I got started, by indulging a little too much in some of those sweeteners. Um, I grew up in a home where baking was just part of every single day. And my dad loved home-baked goods. He wouldn't eat packaged stuff. So my mom was a great baker, and she just baked. All, we always had home-baked goods. And my sisters and I, I have two sisters, we all grew up eating sweets and baking from a very young age. So I really grew up with baked goods all around me. And really, it was sort of a natural progression to just I think become addicted to sugar and sweeteners. So over the years as I baked more and more and I consumed more and more, eventually I realized that I had a problem with sugar and not only did I feel like I was addicted to sugar, but my body started telling me this is not good for you and you really shouldn't be eating this way anymore. So I came down with a condition that's called a candida related complex, which is basically an overgrowth of yeast in the body and as you know, if you've ever baked bread or baked yeast goods, yeast feeds on sugar. So it's kind of an imbalance in the body where the yeast grows out of control. And what you need to do to get it back under control is basically cut out all sugar. Don't feed it until the numbers, the number of, of yeast organisms diminishes enough that you can regain your health. So I was pretty ill for a few years. And what I learned through that was that my body really reacts quickly to high glycemic sweeteners, of which sugar is probably the highest. Um, it will, you know, sugar spikes your blood sugar quicker than anything else. So I learned to bake with other sweeteners that are kinder to my body and easier on the blood sugar levels. And I think that, you know, now I don't really feel like I'm missing anything. I'm really happy with the kinds of desserts that I can create this way. Uh, my friends and family, I feed them all this stuff, and they're totally fine with it. They don't even know that they're eating something, you know, special. So I think it's it's completely doable to live without sugar in your life. And we're just so used to having sugar in so many things that we eat. It seems like an impossible task, but really, it's not hard. It's not hard to live without sugar at all. And it seems like kind of this focus of yours on baking with natural sweeteners, that seems to be a big part of what your blog is all about, and even this newest cookbook of yours. Can you tell us more about that cookbook and what its focus is, as well as the type of recipes, uh, baking recipes specifically, that people can expect to find on your blog? Yeah, absolutely. So this is that, the cookbook that you mentioned. It's naturally sweet and gluten-free. Um, and the tagline is 100 allergy-friendly vegan desserts. And really it was an outgrowth of what I, what I was just saying about the need to create things with natural sweeteners that are not as high on the glycemic index. And I should also say that for most people who, who eat white sugar, I mean, I don't think anybody needs to eat white sugar, refined sugar, but there are lots of natural sweeteners that at the moment I can't eat just because they're higher glycemic. So things like maple syrup or 
dates, for instance, which are really healthful sweeteners in moderation, but I don't use those because my body just can't take them at this point. My metabolism has been changed sufficiently that I, I probably will never eat those again. So in my book, um, obviously I love desserts, and although my blog, um, which is rickyheller.com, my blog also has all kinds of recipes for other things. I mean, the gamut from appetizers through soups and salads, etc. Lots of savory dishes, but desserts are kind of close to my heart. And I think for most people, when you cut out things like whatever it may be, gluten or sugar or eggs or whatever your sensitivity is, the things that give us the most comfort and the things that we love the most are often the desserts. So that was part of the reason why I wanted to work on desserts because that was the kind of recipe that was requested the most often by my readers and when I had a bakery by my customers, they wanted all the, the fancy desserts they, couldn't, they felt they couldn't have anymore. Um, so that was just a natural outgrowth for the book. Um, so yeah, the book covers basically any kind of baking or sweet treats you can think of. From breakfast items like muffins and scones and pancakes and waffles to quick breads and fruit breads to cookies, bars, pies, tarts, cakes and layer cakes. What else is in there? And then there's a whole chapter on raw and non-baked goods. Things like there's a chocolate pate, for instance, or truffles or just raw bars, things like that. So basically anything that's sweet that you can think of that you'd want to have in your life, it's a, there's a recipe for it in this book. So I'd be curious, um, you know, natural sweeteners, that means different things to different people. Um, yeah. Maybe before we even start getting into kind of your, uh, your go-to natural sweeteners, I'd love to hear from maybe Dennis and JL you know, what are your natural sweeteners that you that you enjoy or that you've tried baking with or using in your cooking? Yeah, you know, natural sweeteners for me have been limited to you know a few things. I'm not as knowledgeable, and and I'm afraid I have to say I use honey uh, for my one source of natural sweetener, and I have used Damara sugar. Uh, but other than that, you know, uh, I still think sometimes that sugar in a raw is a natural sweetener, and I know it isn't. But you know, so. Um, I'm afraid I'm I'm not quite as up on these, so this is good information for me too. Well, I have to agree, and I um I I know Ricky, and Ricky knows that I am um I call myself baking challenged, and so um <laughs> I've really loved her book because it's helped me because I actually don't have a huge sweet tooth, um but I do love desserts, and so I what I like about the idea of natural sweeteners is it doesn't always give you that really super sugary flavor and I'm wondering Ricky like if people who are interested in making sort of that kind of less sweet dessert do, are there any of your favorite natural sweeteners that kind of you know that, that fit the bill but don't taste you know too too sweet yeah perfect I mean my well two of my favorite sweeteners and the ones I use the most in the book I would say there there are three that I use the most stevia, coconut sugar, and coconut nectar. So I, I think nowadays a lot of people are familiar with coconut palm sugar. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to hold that up, but anyways, coconut palm sugar, um, which is a very low glycemic sweetener. It's made from the sap of the coconut palm tree. And just the way that they extract the sap from maple trees for maple syrup, they, it's a similar process whereby they extract the sap from the coconut palm. And it the result is this lovely, it's a dry granular sweetener, so it resembles kind of a dry brown sugar, and it has a beautiful, it, the combination flavor is between butterscotch and caramel, in my opinion, that's what I taste, but it's very low on the glycemic index, so it's about 35 on the glycemic index, and if you compare that to, say, an apple, which is around 55, that, that suggests that the lower the number, the less likely something is to spike your blood sugar levels quickly. So it's actually having a milder effect than eating an apple. Now, again, depends how much you use, so it, it's possible. You're, you know, you're not going to go out and eat a whole dessert made with coconut sugar, but it has a very mild effect on your blood sugar level. And I find, I mean, everything I've read before I did my cookbook said, because it's a dry sweetener, you can measure it one for one equivalent to white sugar but personally I don't think that's entirely true because it is not as sweet as white sugar so if you replace your white sugar with coconut sugar and it's a, there's a cup of white sugar originally in the recipe 
and you replace it with a cup of coconut sugar, you will find that that final product is not quite as sweet as the original. So for that reason, I love coconut sugar because you have the choice. You can use more and make it sweeter or do what I do, which is combine coconut sugar with stevia. And I'll, I can talk about stevia too. It's an herbal sweetener. And then you can boost the sweetness that way or you can just go with the, the natural sweetness of the coconut sugar, which isn't overly sweet. Can and I ask a question? Sure. So as far as uh, if you were going to do a ratio, so you're saying that like a cup of like refined sugar, let's say it, is called for in a recipe, and you use coconut sugar, it's not going to be as sweet. So, you know, you give the example of that you could blend it with stevia to make it sweeter, but what would the what would the actual ratio be if you were trying to just use coconut sugar? Would it be like a cup and a half? I would say anywhere between a cup and a cup and a half, yeah. I mean, I would probably start with about a cup and a third and see how that goes. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, But the, the problem there is if you're going to try to do that, don't forget that baking is basically chemistry. So once you're increasing the amount of sugar, you're changing the chemical reaction that's going to happen in your baked good. So you can only add so much extra sugar before you end up with a different texture entirely in the finished product. And that's part of the reason why I loved combining it with the stevia. Because if people know stevia, <clears throat> it's an herbal sweetener that is up to 100 times sweeter than sugar. You only need about, I would say, approximately 5 to 10 drops of liquid stevia to equal maybe a tablespoon or two of sugar. So you can use a quarter teaspoon of liquid stevia to replace that difference between the quarter or third of a cup of coconut sugar that you'd be adding, a quarter of a teaspoon of stevia is not going to change the texture of your final product in any noticeable way. So you're getting that sweetness added to it, but you're not altering the texture. That's such a great tip. Is that keeping it low glycemic too? It really is, yeah. Because And again, because I need to be sure that I'm not spiking my blood sugar when I eat these desserts. and. The glycemic index, you know, there's there's glycemic index and what we call glycemic load. So, I, and I don't want to get too technical because I don't really know all the details. But basically, when they studied glycemic index, they looked at eating, I think it was 50 grams of each food, and then they tested how quickly the blood sugar rose. So they only looked at one single food at a time. So, for instance, when you're eating white sugar, somebody had to swallow 50 grams of white sugar for them to test it and see that it's 100 on the glycemic index. But the glycemic load looks more at the reality, which is you never eat sugar on its own, or you shouldn't <laughs> eat sugar on its own. So it would, the glycemic load is a reflection of the whole food and all the different ingredients working together. So if coconut sugar on its own is only 35, and I'm combining it with high fiber flours, and I'm combining it with healthy fats, and all those things that go in my baked goods, the total effect is going to be even lower. So. When I eat one of my baked goods, honestly, like I often eat some of these baked goods for breakfast even though they're touted as desserts in the book because I know I'm not going to have that, that leap and then crash. I just feel like I'm eating nutritious food. You know? the, um, and JL, you were asking about sort of non-sweet desserts. There's one dessert in the book that's called a pumpkin apple crumble. Mm -hmm. So it's basically just a crumble and, and the, I think the only grain in there is oats. And it, and it combined with some nuts ground up and then the mixture of the apple and pumpkin is in the middle and it's kind of a layered thing. Well, you know, it's not very sweet. I, if I eat a piece of that for breakfast, it lasts me till lunchtime. I feel like I don't need anything else till lunchtime. And that's where really the whole idea of the glycemic load comes into play because I don't feel like that's affecting me in any way. You know, I remember when I used to eat a muffin for breakfast and I would feel this charge and, and then I would have the crash. I don't get that with this. You know, a lower glycemic load, you're going to have a nice slow rise, feel pretty energized, feel, feel pretty good, it's going to last, and then it's going to slowly dip until lunchtime, and then you're ready to eat something else. So I, I think for that reason, these are, these are great sweeteners. And uh, just to go back to what Dennis was saying, when you combine it with the stevia, the whole effect, you're lowering it even more, because stevia is zero on the glycemic index. It has no effect on your blood sugar at all. Is the, the crash what makes us hungry, too, sometimes early? From what I understand in terms of the body chemistry, yeah, your body is saying, I, I need more sugar, I need to get those insulin levels back in balance, and, and you, you feel that urge and that motivation to eat more sugar to raise your blood sugar level back to what feels like normal again. So keeping it lower and, and not raising it and not spiking it is going to, you're not going to crave as much to eat. Yeah. 
I mean, because what goes up must come down, and once and, and you have it, it's the idea is the sharp rise and the sharp fall is what makes us run to go get something sweet or something carby. Whereas if you have a nice steady line across, you never have the cravings. It, it's interesting. As I know, JL, you're you're big into savory breakfasts, and if I do a savory breakfast. I don't have that craving later in the day because I don't have the the emotional or the physical urge to eat something sweet. Mm -hmm. So one question that I have that you kind of referred to is using high fiber flours. Is that something that you also tend to do a lot of when you're baking with natural sweeteners to try to again help that kind of glycemic load? Yeah, because what's going to help to lower the, the overall glycemic index or load is uh, both fiber, protein, and fat when you combine them with your sweet sweeteners or your refined foods that's going to lower the effect overall so so many of my bakers well part of it is just because as a holistic nutritionist or having studied holistic nutrition I'm really big into whole foods and real foods and I don't like things that are overly processed and that's part of the reason obviously why I love you know the Atune and the Air One cereals because they're made out of the whole food and so few ingredients added and so little refinement because again that's going to affect your blood sugar so part of what I try to do is use whole grain flours and when you're using whole grain flours you have literally the whole grain in there so they haven't removed anything but that's also why whole grain flours don't last as long as say white all-purpose flour because the all-purpose flour has had the germ removed from it um, and that's where the natural oils are and it's the oils that can go rancid so if you're using like a whole grain brown rice flour, it still has the natural oils in there, and that's why you probably know when you're dealing with gluten-free flours, often you're told to store them in the freezer because that will extend their their life. Um, I don't have to do that because I go through them so quickly. <laughs> so they don't last that long in my house. What would be a high fiber flour that I would know just sitting on a shelf? I mean. In quinoa flour, flour uh, brown rice flour versus white rice flour, because the brown rice flour has the the bran still so in it. So we're talking more about gluten free flours then. Even the if, you, um, if you get now, for, uh, again, I, I remember being absolutely shocked, and Dennis, you probably know this as a chef. When I first learned that whole wheat flour is not actually the whole grain. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you want to look for whole grain whole wheat flour. Okay. And if it's whole grain, then it's still going to have the bran that's going to be okay. high fiber. So the, the clarification there is wheat flour versus whole wheat flour. Do you know what I mean? Whole grain. Whole, whole wheat grain. Flour. Whole grain. The, the words you're looking for are whole grain. Right. In whatever kind of flour, whether it's gluten-free, wheat, whatever it may be, um, whole grain is where you're going to get all the fiber and all the goodness of the original grain. Hmm. They play a lot of games with words to, to fool yeah. people, so yeah. that, that, that's part of it. And one of the things I learned, too, with flowers in making this book, because and it, it was just by chance because some of my testers were not able to um, buy some of the flowers they just weren't, weren't available in their neighborhoods so one of the things I learned is you can literally take the grains the whole grains and make your own flowers and it's very easy at home so for instance I use millet flour a lot which is obviously if you have millet grain it's the whole grain and you're gonna get all the fiber and everything in that grain you put a quarter of a cup of millet into your coffee grinder or your spice grinder and whir it up until it's powdered and that's millet flour. That's whole grain millet flour that you can use for your baking. Are you ready for this, Ricky? I actually made my own flour and baked something because I learned that from you. I took steel cut oats, put them in my Vitamix, and made a flour and felt like a Ricky Heller rock star. So I just want you to know that. <laughs> Way to go! <laughs> can you do that in a food processor? No, it won't. It won't grind it fine enough. Okay. Yeah, but don't try that with rice. My understanding is rice will break your blades. Um, mm. There, there are certain, you know, the small mm. grains like buckwheat, amaranth, uh, quinoa, and what's the other one I just said? Oh, it's millet. And millet. Those work mm. beautifully. But I, you need an actual grain mill if you want to do rice. Okay. <laughs> just so people know. <laughs> Good to know. Jay, I want to jump in. Oh yeah, <laughs> I think Annalise and I are going to say the same thing. I was just going to say we have. Um, I want to say hello to Stephanie who joined us. And Stephanie, you asked a question about coconut sugar, but believe it or not, you might have joined a little late, and Ricky actually already talked about that, but I don't know um, if you want to to watch the video again, or Ricky, maybe do you want to give like a 15-second a summary of what you just said about coconut sugar? What Stephanie asked was that she's been hearing a lot about coconut sugar, and she wondered what you think about it. And I love I, it. 
Sure. Can I tack on to that for just a moment? Because uh, Ricky did talk about coconut sugar, but you also mentioned coconut nectar, and I'd love to hear the differentiation of the two of them if it's just a texture thing as well as your 15-second spiel. Okay, so coconut sugar, beautiful low glycemic uh, sweetener, similar to brown sugar. It's a dry sweetener, and you can use it one for one, but just expect it to be ever so slightly less sweet in the final product. The coconut nectar, um, you can see, because it's already started, it's a thick sort of syrup, right? So coconut nectar is similar. It's, it's a nice replacement for brown rice syrup with a slightly lower glycemic index than brown rice syrup. Um, I've found two two different kinds of coconut nectar in my travels. One of them is the, like the one I just showed you, which is very thick and very sticky. And then there's another brand that comes with a very loose, um, more watery texture. And I'm not sure if it's because they, they process it differently or one isn't 100% pure coconut nectar. But the one I use is definitely the pure coconut nectar. And the way they make that, it's the same process as the coconut sugar. With, with the coconut sugar, they extract the sap from the, the coconut palm tree and they dehydrate it to get this, this sugar. With the nectar, they don't dehydrate it as much, so they end up with the, the syrup. So they're both very similar in flavor, um, but I do find they have different purposes. Like I love using the coconut nectar for things that need to be really chewy in, in the final product or things that I want, like when I do my caramel sauces or my caramel. There was a, a great recipe um, I did for the Attune Foods blog, and I'm going to, oh, here it is. I'm going to see if I, now I'm going to try my, my screen sharing here and see if I can do that. So what I did was I created um, a bar that had um, a caramel topping. Here it is. Let's see if people can see that. Can people see that? I don't know if you guys can see that on screen. There yes. you go. Yeah, so this topping here, that's caramel, and that's made with coconut nectar as well as um, almond almond butter in that case. Now, now, how do I get back to... Just mm. click on that's it. Um, so yeah, it's perfect for things like caramel sauces and puddings and so on. And it has a very similar flavor to the coconut sugar. So um, there's no coconut flavor in either of these really? No, which is... I know it's kind of shocking, but no, it's not. And you know, it's funny because when you're often when people are on restricted diets, there seems to be a lot of coconut in what we make. Um, I was not a huge fan of coconut before I found I, I before I went vegan and started eating a lot more nuts and coconut and whatnot. And I love coconut now, but uh, these two are completely no coconut flavor whatsoever. Yeah, they just taste like a lovely butterscotchy sweetener. What fat would you use when you're making these then? Coconut oil. <laughs> okay, that's what I was that was what I was leading to and I wasn't sure. Actually, I use coconut oil <clears throat> because it is the most healthful plant-based oil. Um, but coconut oil, you know, if you're making a transition or if you're looking to cut cholesterol in your diet, coconut oil because it's plant-based, cholesterol-free, but the beauty of coconut oil is it's a great sub for butter because it is the only plant-based oil that's solid at room temperature. So anything under 76 degrees Fahrenheit is going to be solid at room temperature. You get above, it starts to melt. But um, in some applications, like, you know, I love it for pastry, and, and pie crust, and shortbread. I just did a shortbread recipe with coconut oil, obviously, and it's great. But um, if you want something where you need a liquid oil, like a cake, or even in some of my cookies, I'll use a liquid. I tend to use sunflower oil only because I find it's very mild flavor and I like it. But a lot of people use grapeseed oil. There are, there are other kinds of, you know, re relatively healthy liquid oils that you can use too. It doesn't have to be coconut oil. Now with coconut oil, that does tend to turn liquid pretty quick, from at least the stuff I've used. Uh, would you freeze it if you were making a pie crust, or would you, to, to keep the consistency so it doesn't thaw out so quick, turn to liquid so quick? Oh, you mean while you're, you're, you're mixing up the crust and you're cutting it into the... Yeah, I mean, get it, get it even colder so it, it holds the shape a little longer? Yeah, a little bit. You do not have to freeze it. I'll tell you, you freeze coconut oil, you'll need a knife to hack it. Like, you just won't be able to okay. get through it. But in the refrigerator for five minutes, it'll, it firms up really quickly. And what I tend to do, um, because I guess, Dennis, if you're not baking gluten-free, when you're baking gluten-free, it doesn't matter how much you work the flour. It's never going to get tough. 
So what I tend to do okay, with okay. my with my crusts is because it's the gluten, you're overworking the gluten that makes it tough, right? With gluten-free flour, that doesn't matter. You can work it as many times as you want, and it won't get tough. So what I'll do with my crusts is if if it's soft, I'll, I don't roll my my pie crusts often. I'll just pat them into the pie plate, and then I'll put the actual crust in the refrigerator to get really cold before I bake it, and then it'll it'll work out that way. Okay. Yeah. Because coconut oil does harden up pretty quickly. Yes, I, I found that out. <laughs> the hard, you know, I, I was using it and I, I loved it. It was really nice oil. I used to rub it on my face while I was baking things too, yeah. <laughs> to get rid of wrinkles and things. Lovely well, moisturizer at night. <laughs> yeah, and, and I love the smell of it. Uh, it reminded me of going to the beach. But uh, I found that, you know, when I used it with chocolate and things, it would really firm up quick. Yeah, it really does. It really does. You have to keep it. Nice lip gloss, too. It doesn't matter if you eat it. <laughs> I love the visuals y'all are giving, Dennis. I can imagine you just <laughs> patting I'm it on. <laughs> yeah, we all need to go to the beach and put it on, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's um, that's a really nice nice combination, too. The coconut is just so versatile. It's, it's amazing. And I wanted to talk. Can I talk a little bit about stevia, too? Can I ask you one quick question, though, related to coconut oil? It's actually from one of our viewers. Um, yes. Renee, um, thanks you for, you were answering her question just about the time she was typing it about using coconut oil instead of butter, but what she'd like to know is um, the ratio. So if you're replacing coconut oil for butter, is there a ratio to follow? There actually is, and part of it's experimentation. And again, this is one of those things where everything I read says one for one, but honestly, I have found that does not always work. And the reason I understand it doesn't is because butter isn't just fat. It's not 100% fat. Butter is part milk solids, right, which is why you can make ghee and you're removing the milk solids. So if you just use coconut oil one for one instead of butter, you're actually adding excess oil to the recipe. So I always, if I'm say, let's say my original recipe was a cup of butter, I'm not going to use a full cup of coconut oil. I might remove two tablespoons of oil. Like I'll measure a cup, remove two tablespoons, just to be sure I have a little bit less, like maybe 10% less. And that may not be the exact ratio because I haven't researched how much milk fat is in butter, but it has worked for me. I always just skim off a little bit off the top if I'm going to replace butter with coconut oil in my recipes. But if you, you know, the recipes that I've developed, like in my book or the short or on my blog, obviously I've created those with the proper amount of coconut oil in there. You don't have to change anything if you're using one of my recipes. But if you're converting something from a traditional recipe that originally had butter, you want to be sure you use just a little bit less coconut oil, I would say, or you're going to end up with a greasy final product. I've used coconut oil to make buffalo sauce instead of butter. It comes out great. Okay. I mean, I love As a my Canadian, buffalo. I'm not even sure what buffalo sauce is. Well, that's what they put on buffalo wings. That's hot sauce, butter, and honey is how I make them usually. But I had to make them, uh, make them with the coconut oil one time to see if they came out. It wasn't quite as thick, but it was the flavor was excellent. So and of obviously, course, being he a vegan, them on the vegan ones, right? Yeah, I'm just saying, wings. Being a vegan, he <laughs> buffalo wings. So. That explains why I don't know what it is. I have never eaten a chicken wing in my whole life. But I, I had a friend tell me that she made buffalo. Um, was Satan? Uh, I, I always call it Satan. Uh, yeah, I always call it Satan, but Satan. <laughs> she she made uh, strips out of that and buffalo, and she said it was excellent. Ooh, that so. sounds good. Yeah. Mhm. Mm that would be yummy. <laughs> so, a question that I have is: um, you've talked about stevia, you've talked about coconut nectar and coconut sugar. You know, I would imagine that most of us probably have a Whole Foods or we have some sort of specialty food store. I think even a lot of the conventional stores probably would carry stevia, but things like coconut nectar might be a little bit harder to find. Do you tend to purchase these items at just like a local specialty store, or do you order them online? I, I mean, I'm in the greater Toronto area, and you know, Toronto is a huge city. So even though I'm not right in the city, all of the suburbs are sort of they have the same vibe. So I have a, a local health food store I go to. And I never have, in fact, some of these items I first learned of because they were offering them in the health food store. But, uh, you know, in the States, if you're in the States, or even in Canada, I mean, I know a lot of people have a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's maybe near them or something similar. And also Amazon.com has all of these items, all of them. No problem finding them. Um, so things like the coconut sugar or even coconut oil, they, they, they have pretty much, I mean, you guys probably know this better than I because I don't, 
the Canadian Amazon doesn't actually offer food yet, but they pretty much have everything, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> and also the fact that they deliver wherever you are, which is great. Yeah. Um, if you're in Canada, there's a place called Upaya Naturals, U-P-A-Y-A, -A, that delivers across Canada as well. And it's, it's an online store that has a, all of these ingredients. And um, for instance, this one, I don't know if you can see, this is basically, it's just this dark liquid, see? It looks like molasses. This is Yacon syrup, which is also, that's the, the other very low glycemic sweetener that I, I don't use as much because it has a very strong flavor. It's very similar to molasses, and it's often compared to molasses. I always, I, I say in my book, it's a combination of molasses that's been fermented with a bit of apple cider vinegar because it has a slight, slightly, slightly sour taste too. Um, but I will use that wherever the original recipe called for molasses because I, molasses is too high glycemic for my body. Um, and that I can get online at Upaya Naturals very, really easily. That's where I get mine. So it's, it's not, I think nowadays more and more it's not hard to find these ingredients. Um, yeah, if you have access, if you have access online, or if you are near a health food store. Yeah. But one of the I, things I, I say, I, yep. No, I was gonna say I found coconut oil in Sam's Club yesterday. There you go, and I hear it's at Costco too. You can get organic coconut oil. At yeah, Costco. that's what it was. Or organic, extra virgin coconut oil. So I was surprised. So yeah. it's going more main. Things are going more mainstream. I bought my last bag of coconut sugar at Costco. Or wow. that coconut sugar, yeah. The price was great. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I think, you know, that, uh, oh, the thing I was, was just about to say is because I know a lot of the viewers, I mean, for me, it's a bit, um, I'm a bit different in that I'm almost eating the way someone, you know, who might be a type 2 diabetic would eat in terms of the sweeteners. I don't ever want something to spike my blood sugar levels. But if you're just interested in healthy, healthful natural sweeteners and you don't have issues, um, there are so many other natural sweeteners out there that are a lot easier to get and that you can easily convert your recipes. Things like maple syrup, as I said earlier, brown rice syrup. There's date sugar and maple sugar, which is dehydrated maple syrup. Um, even just dates, you know, gr uh, grind dates up in a food processor to a paste. I used to use that in a lot of baking before I went lower glycemic. So um, there's sucanat, um, S-U-C-A-N-A-T, which looks like brown sugar, but it's actually entirely unrefined brown sugar. So sucanat, what's great about sucanat is it still retains all of the original vitamins and minerals of the sugar cane plant that it came from, unlike white sugar, once they refine white sugar, what they're doing is removing all that stuff, and that's what ends up in the molasses, um, and the white sugar is basically devoid of nutrients. So if you want to keep those nutrients in, in a dry sweetener, something like sucanat um, or rapadura, they're still unrefined, and they, they still have all the vitamins, minerals uh, that the original plant would have had. But they still give you that sugar spike. They will, yeah. Yeah, I hate to say it, but they will. <laughs> but it tastes so good. <laughs> so, JL, do we have any questions? Um, well, Dante just says hi, so let's all say hey to Dante. Um, and <laughs> and then we have um, a question from Dominique, and she identifies as being young, and she says that she's making home baked cookies. And she doesn't know what would be good to go with cookies. So I'm not entirely sure what you're asking, Dominique. But since you're young and you want to bake, I'll bet you Ricky has some great advice to inspire you to keep baking as a young person. Yeah, I mean, I started young, and just keep at it. It, it, it. It's great to start out with easy recipes. And I don't know how young you are, but you know, if you're if you got somebody there in the kitchen with you who's been baking before and can help you with all the details that you're, you're not familiar with, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. And there, for a nice, easy um, recipe to start with, something maybe like a sugar cookie. I The first cookie I ever baked was chocolate chip cookies with my great aunt and my mom. Uh, and those were pretty easy to do. So there are lots of things to start with that will give you success, and then you'll be happy to keep baking after that. Going with cookies, I mean, milk is a classic. <laughs> Absolutely. All the milk. <laughs> yeah, all the milk. So it's great. And uh, yeah, I mean, 
it is kind of cookie season now, isn't it? So thinking about some of the cookies people might be baking, uh, do, do we want to talk about some of our favorites, maybe? Well, sure. it, with cookie sweeteners, you were going to stay more along the lines of dry sweeteners, wouldn't you, than liquid? Uh, you know what? I, I tend to use both, actually. Um, I find the way I've now developed my recipes, there's a combination. So I don't always use coconut sugar. I sometimes use coconut nectar. Like I was saying, um, the way that, that I bake, you don't have, I don't use high fat content. I do still use oils and fats. But if you want something with, that's really chewy and you don't have as much sugar in there to caramelize, if you use coconut nectar, it's going to help with that texture. Okay. I, I have a question with a favorite cookie because I, you know, um, tried to actually make holiday cookies for a vegan holiday cookie swap on Sunday. They were very delicious, and they actually didn't require a lot of sweetener. But it, the one sweetener was powdered sugar, so it was a very basic recipe. It was I used vegan butter. I used um, it was a cup of that, two cups of flour, and then it called for a third cup of powdered sugar and then some ground up pecans. So my question would be, what would you replace with the powdered sugar? Well, you can make your own powdered sugar with coconut sugar. Again, that coffee okay. grinder is a lifesaver. You just grind it up for powdered. But I think conventional powdered sugar also has a bit of cornstarch in it. It does. So um, if I were to make my own powdered sugar, I don't use cornstarch too much. Uh, it's not that I can't use it, but I would only use it with organic um, cornstarch because most non-organic corn is genetically modified. Right. So if you can get organic cornstarch and you're okay with corn, you know you can just add a little cornstarch to your powdered sugar. But my favorite replacement for cornstarch is potato starch. So I would use a little bit of potato starch and grind it up with uh, with the um, coconut sugar and create a powdered sugar that way. Um, then I'm throwing into the mix the whole issue of gluten-free, which is a bit different probably from what you did, JL, right? Right. So, for instance, that sounds almost like a shortbread cookie that you're describing. Is that Was that the texture? Well, yes. In our house, they were called Wayne's cookies because my Uncle Wayne loved them. I had no idea what they were, but I think other people also call them Mexican wedding cakes or Russian okay. tea cookies. Oh, those are yummy. And yeah. those are very much like a shortbread texture. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so in having just done this shortbread that I, I, I baked a, couple, a, a week or two ago, um, I'm going to add something to bind it so that it doesn't fall apart. So something like either xanthan gum or my favorite lately, my gluten-free binder, is psyllium husk which is a fiber basically that becomes gel-like when you add liquid and so I use that as both an egg substitute and a binder. So I would maybe do something like that. I find if you use nut butters in your cookies they can act as a binder and they and you'll end up with a more shortbready texture as well because nuts give it that slightly grainy very rich buttery texture. So there are different ways, depending on what you want your final cookie to be, there are different ways to do that. That's great advice. I love it. We have a question here on, back on the event page from Michaela Ballman, and she says she joined late. Not sure if you've discussed coconut butter yet. She's tried making some by blending coconut shreds in her Vitamix. Haven't used it yet, but seen a lot of vegan fudge recipes that call for it. Is there anything that can be subbed for coconut butter? Any difference between store-bought coconut butter and homemade? Wow, yeah, I mean, the first, I'll answer one question first, because this one, I am sorry to say, I have not found a good sub for coconut butter, and the reason why is um, coconut butter is simply, as you said, pulverized coconut to the point of a liquid texture. So I've done this in my Vitamix many times, in my high power blender, I've just put coconut, unsweetened coconut in there. In fact, I posted this on Instagram in a video to show people how easy it is because it takes literally less than 30 seconds. You, you put your, about two cups of coconut shreds in your blender, so you start blending it, you, you tamp it down, and you have a liquid fairly quickly. And when it's um, basically slightly warmed like that because you've got the coconut flesh and all the natural oils in the coconut, everything blending together, you have a liquid, but it's a liquid that hardens very quickly at room temperature. So if you imagine how hard a piece of coconut, dried coconut is, and now you've got this mass that you've poured into a jar or a bowl or whatever, and it completely um, hardens back at room temperature again. So coconut butter at room temperature is totally solid. You need a knife to cut into it. You have to usually warm it before you can measure it. 
Whereas contrast that to coconut oil, which is just the fat of the coconut, um, at room temperature, as you said, Dennis, it starts to soften very quickly. So I love coconut butter for things like fudge because, you know, if you've ever used or made, say, um, natural almond butter, or I love making homemade walnut butter, it's liquid at room temperature, basically. But if you combine it with this coconut butter, which has a tendency to be rock hard at room temperature, it's going to end up with something semi-solid or, or a soft solid, almost like um, a frosting or something, or a fudge. And so that's why it's used so much in vegan fudge. I, um, in my book, I have a recipe for buttercream frosting that's based on coconut butter. And once you add liquids to it and, and the liquid sweeteners and you whip it, it's almost identical texture to buttercream frosting because it'll stay firm. You can pipe it. It won't melt and droop the way pure coconut oil-based frosting will at room temperature. But um, when you refrigerate it, it doesn't get rock hard because it has all those other ingredients to soften it. So I love coconut butter. I just love it. And you can melt it on toast or whatever you know, as a spread, too. Um, for your other question, the difference between homemade and uh, store-bought, I found even with a high-powered blender, it's never quite as fine texture. Like the store-bought texture, when you melt it, it, it's, you know, on your tongue, you don't even have any sense of graininess whatsoever. The one I make in my blender at home, it looks like a liquid when I blend it, and it is very, very, very fine, but I can still detect a slight powdery texture. Like there's, there is a texture to it. So it's never 100% as fine as the one you're going to buy. I don't find that makes a huge difference, and given the the savings in, in the price, to me it's worth it to make my own. It's so economical to make your own. So I love I love using coconut butter and all kinds of things. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. One question I have for you as far as so we've talked about from a glycemic in, index uh, standpoint, one of the reasons to make with natural sweeteners. Um, we've even talked about natural sweeteners um, that are not part of the low glycemic index but still considered natural. You know, I almost wonder if you would touch a little bit about the source of where sugar comes from when it's conventional and not organic, because you talked about cornstarch a little bit, and so I think that in some ways, kind of the role of sugar beets and specifically gen genetic modification is that something that you know um, a little bit about, and is that does that also play into uh, just your rationale and reasoning for trying to encourage other people to also consider natural sweeteners and teaching them along the way? Well, I, yeah, I think one of the bonuses of the natural sweeteners is so many of them are organic. Um, I don't know a huge amount uh, about the sugar beets, but I do know that there is a trend towards more genetically modified ingredients in, in all of these commodities like sugar or, um, you know, even wheat because they're produced in such mass quantities that it's, they're, they're, they're creating genetic modifications of them so that they can produce them more efficiently. So because so much sugar from, uh, and again, I, I may be a bit behind the curve on this one because I haven't been looking at white sugar for so long, but um, from what I understand right now, sugar beets are the primary source of most sugar. Um, you know, it used to be sugar cane, but I don't think that white sugar, because it's too expensive, I don't think they make it from sugar cane mostly anymore. It's uh, am I am I right? It's sugar beets that they. Uh, I don't know if anyone else knows. Yeah, Dennis, you're nodding. So I, th I think um, so. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, if that's the case, you want to be very careful because you could inadvertently be consuming genetically modified organisms. And we, in my opinion, we don't know yet what the long term effects are of those kinds of foods. So I'm very wary of something that's been modified. You know, you could have your sugar might have a fish gene in it or whatever. I mean, I'm just saying that as an example. I don't know if that's true, but the possibility of combining two different species or qualities in your food that wasn't naturally there. Um, and I know a lot of people who are pro-genetic modification will cite the fact that hybridization, you know, we hybridized our plants for centuries where we combined the, the genes of one plant and another plant, but to me, there's a difference where that could happen in nature. If those two things were planted beside each other and the wind blew, they could naturally hybridize that way. You're never going to get a fish gene mixing with a plant in nature. So to me, that's where I draw the line uh, between hybridization and genetic modification. And that's just my opinion. But I, I'm not comfortable with it personally. Um, so that's, that's part of the reason why you might want to at least carefully assess what goes into the products that you're buying that way if they have sugar. 
Um, one other question I have about baking with natural sweeteners. So we've talked about the fact that coconut nectar and coconut sugar both have this lovely butterscotch flavor profile, and the fact that stevia is, I think you said, a thousand times sweeter than actual sugar. Up to 100. You, sorry, <laughs> up to 100. Um, do you tend to think about the sweetener in terms of how it's going to affect the overall flavor when you're deciding which type of sweetener to use? Absolutely, you kind of have to, you know, and and that's why, um, like I said, those have that kind of flavor, so they're perfect for things like caramel or butterscotch or chocolate. I mean, chocolate basically overtakes everything. So if you if you're making something chocolate, it almost doesn't matter which sweetener you use, you'll still taste the chocolate more than anything. But I know that nowadays there's been a little bit of controversy about agave nectar. I don't know if you're familiar with what's been going on with that because it's such high fructose, and some people are wary of using agave. And again, my feeling is, in, in small amounts, I'm, hap I'm okay using it the same way I would use any other sweetener, especially if I'm buying an organic, raw product that I know hasn't been overly um, processed. So I think I have four recipes in my cookbook that I did retain the original agave that I was thinking about because out of all the natural sweeteners, agave is the one with the mildest taste. But also, you want to consider what your final product looks like. So, you know, if I have a vanilla layer cake and I use coconut sugar, my layer cake is going to be a lovely tan color when it's finished. And if you tell someone this is vanilla, you know, they might not be all that enthused about eating a brown vanilla cake. So, for those kind of recipes, the vanilla, the lemon, the banana, I did use agave uh, because partly what it looks like and partly because the flavor is so mild and it doesn't overpower the other flavors that are in that final baked good. So yeah, I think that's really important too. JL, do we have any other questions? I think we just have one last one. Um, Dante wants to know what kind of cookies you like to make, Ricky. Well, if it has chocolate in it, I'll make it. So basically, basically anything with chocolate. One of my favorites that I did reproduce for this book before I went gluten free. It was called chocolate mint chocolate chip cookies. So they're a chocolate cookie with chocolate chips, and they're very they're almost like a brownie texture. Love those, and I have a version of those in this book. Um, and you know, speaking, I mean, I know technically they're not a cookie cookie, but brownies are considered a bar. I uh, probably brownies are one of my favorites. That uh, you know, any kind of bar that has a brownie base. Or like those caramel slices that I showed you before, a chocolate base with anything on top of it uh, are my favorites. And it, depending how much time I have, if I'm in a big rush, bars are always easy because you just put it in a pan, you bake it in one piece, you don't have to scoop out individual cookies. So I like bars because <laughs> I'm lazy. <laughs> Great. We're practical. We're practical. Yeah, I like that better. That's a much better way of putting it. Yeah. And then you just cut them when you're done. Exactly. All right. Well, um, JL, Dennis, do you have any other questions for Ricky? Oh, it's been a lot of information to take in. I learned a lot. Thanks. Oh, my pleasure. You made me want to go out and get coconut nectar, Ricky. Uh, yeah, me too. And coconut sugar. Yeah. All right, yay, my job is done. And I'm <laughs> going to make powdered sugar from my coconut sugar, and I'm going to add potato starch in it, and then I'm going to make Wayne's cookies again. <laughs> and I would love to know how, these, how those come I will. Totally. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for watching and for asking your questions. I hope that this time with Ricky, JL, Dennis, and myself has been instructive as far as giving you new ideas uh, in your cookie baking and specifically in baking with natural sweeteners. Join us again soon for another Google Plus Hangout on Air with the Tune Foods. Happy and, holidays. And Elise, can, I, yes. can I add one more thing? We forgot to mention we have a very exciting Pinterest campaign going on, a sweepstakes. Um, so my role with the Tune Foods is the plant-based team leader. And so for those of you who are vegans and are getting ready for the holidays, we shared with you some tips on the Tune Foods website. Go to the community section where the blog is to kind of give you ideas on um, how to handle the holidays when you're going home, if you're going home for Christmas next week. Um, and we want you to pin your favorite holiday dish on our Pinterest board called Vegan Holidays, and you will be entered to win a $100 Whole Foods gift card. And I will put links to both the blog post and the Pinterest campaign 
on the event page. I'll do that as soon as we hang up. So sorry, I just wanted to jump in with that, Annalise. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. it's it's a really fun way to kind of pin uh, what's enticing you this holiday season and a chance to win a hundred dollar gift card to Whole Foods. So, all right. Well, thanks again, everyone, and happy holidays. Happy, happy holidays. holidays. Bye. 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 -bye.